is our ju.eu and get red Hello. Blimey, now it's on. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to the Paris Air Lab to, and, and to this conversation about sustainability and technology um, and decarbonisation and digital transformation and all those other things. There's, I think at the moment, no topic more important and no topic more current than the discussion about emissions and what's going to happen with aviation and where aviation goes. Tomorrow, the, the finance ministries of a number of European co uh, countries are meeting to have a conversation about whether or not we should put a tax on fuel. In the meantime, the European Commission has accepted as a target to be completely carbon neutral by 2050. Some countries within Europe, Finland by way of example, has said they'd like to be carbon neutral by 2035. And in the middle of that, we continue to see traffic grow and grow at really quite remarkable rates, such that even within the aviation industry, their frankly more modest target of, of having the same level emissions, of emissions by 2050 as they had in 2005 doesn't actually quite cut the mustard, particularly in a situation where, as I say, the volume of traffic is continuing to grow really rapidly. So we're going, something isn't going to work here. Something doesn't fit. And one, on one side, we have environmental lobbying groups, we have uh, environmental agencies talking about the existential threat that is the carbon emission and global warming threat. And I saw in the newspaper yesterday a photograph of a polar bear walking into a village in Siberia because he or she had nowhere else to go. And yet, we are also here, surrounded by this amazing technology and all these people who, let's face it, if you're here, you're an aviation geek, right? And you love everything about aviation. And that's easy to say, but somehow or other, those two worlds are literally going to collide. So we need to start to think about how we do decarbonise. We need to start to think about what the digital opportunities are, what artificial intelligence is, and what it might be. And there, are, there is no better person or there are no better people than the two gentlemen that are with me on the stage. My name is Andrew Charlton. I'm from Aviation Advocacy, but I'm only here to ask the questions. The, the people you need to speak to are, <coughs> excuse me, are Mr. Axel Krein, who is the Executive Director of Clean Sky, the Clean Sky Joint Undertaking, and Mr. Florian Guillemont, who is the Executive Director of the CESAR Joint Undertaking, two European initiatives uh, aiming at exactly this, this task. So maybe, Florian, I'll start with you, just for everybody. Can you very quickly tell me what the CESAR Joint Undertaking actually is? Yep. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, well, very briefly, um, you all have very fantastic vehicles, uh, aircrafts, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, Axel will talk about how they are going to evolve to the next generation. CESAR is really about how we operate the system. So how do we operate all those vehicles in the skies, but as well on airports? Uh, and the core of it is uh, what we call air traffic management. So how do we make sure that we separate aircrafts from one another to ensure their safety? And what CESAR is about is how do we modernize this system? Uh, we have delivered the first batch of uh, solutions. Some of them are being implementing to uh, upgrade this system. I would say that now we are moving into full speed into uh, digital transformation of that system. We may talk about it later on, but it's really about how do we operate uh, the aviation system from a safety standpoint, but as well in terms of efficiency of the system. So it, when you talk about updating the system or modernizing the system, again, today, we control aeroplanes as if it's 1955. We use radars, we use VHF radios. At some levels, we're a little bit like the telecommunications industry in Africa, aren't we? Isn't there this huge opportunity to leapfrog whole generations of technology and go straight into the digital area? Um, well, I'm not sure I would subscribe free to this analogy, <laughs> but uh, to a certain extent, you're right. I think we, we, are, we are still uh, using, to a large extent, technologies that were developed after the Second World War. Uh, they've been, of course, largely upgraded since then. Since then. 
but the, the overall logic of the system remains pretty much the same. Um, what is clear is that we have an opportunity now to go much faster, and this is the purpose of CESAR. I think one of our difficulties, and that's why the connection with the aircraft is so important, is as well, today we control in the sky very, very modern aircraft, which are very well equipped in terms of connectivity, in terms of uh, automation, but we have as well to control all the rest. Uh, and you know, the lifetime of an aircraft is 30, 40 years for some of them which means that we have aircraft that were delivered about 40 years ago which are still flying and still need to be operated in this complex environment. Well, indeed, you're ahead of me because Axel, I was going to turn to you and ask, what does the Clean Sky joint undertaking do? Clean Sky is the biggest European uh, aeronautics research program focused on product innovations. Um, and by, by products, you mean the aeroplane? Aeroplanes, exactly, right. yes. And, and we do have uh, clear, distinct targets with regard to sustainability. So we have a target of reducing the CO2 by 20 to 30 percent, reducing the NOx by 20 to 30 percent, and as well reducing the noise by 20 to 30 percent. Uh, in the framework of our work up to uh, 2024, um, in comparison uh, to products uh, flying in 2014. So that's, that's the framework, and we are uh, roughly having 5,000 people, 5,000 engineers, scientists, uh, all over Europe working on that, on that game. Historically, I think everybody thought you could either reduce the NOx, reduce the noise, or reduce the emissions, but you couldn't have all three. Do you think we can have all three? We can't have all three at the same time with full speed. I think there need to be compromises between one and the other because, uh, for example, in terms of engines, depending a bit on the temperature which is used within the engines, you either have an optimal CO2 impact or an optimal NOx impact. So there are diverging interests uh, in current gas turbines. But when you think a bit further in terms of electrical propulsion, for example, um, the question is how far out is that? We may come to that in a second. Uh, but this is then a question where we will tackle the, uh, all three elements at the same time, the CO2, the NOx and the noise. If we go down the electrical path. Um, the targets that you have, how do they fit with the European target of being carbon neutral by 2050? Actually, th this is the first step. Uh, when, you, when you look at the horizon, as you rightly said, 2050, and basically what we do is we calculate now back. Uh, when you want to be carbon-free in 2050, you need to put product into the market uh, right now already, but also uh, uh, on, the, on the way, beginning of 2030, in the 40s, in order to be really uh, getting all these products which are currently sold, which are currently delivered, uh, out of the market. And you need to offer something which is significantly better what we have today. So we are thinking about, um, and this is more focused on the next Clean Sky program, the Clean Sky 3 program, uh, which is going to be part of Horizon Europe, uh, the next framework program, uh, where we are thinking about uh, putting technologies in place which allow the uh, system engine aircraft manufacturers to put an all new product into the market around 20. 33, 2035, uh, with a significant reduction in CO2 in, in order to get closer to that zero emission uh, by, by 2050. So then, thank you. To, to come back, Florian, to your point about the fact that airframes are long-term investments and, and usually go 40 years, 50 years even, yep. how do you reconcile the sort of time frame that Axel's talking about, 2035, with the work you're doing? Um, well, first of all, I think it's essential that we anticipate on things, and that's the very purpose of programs like Clean Sky and Cesar and the, the cooperation that we are setting up as well, to anticipate uh, on the evolution of those products, to make sure that when they come into operations, we do optimize their operations. And uh, um, just to make a, an analogy which is uh, very different from aviation, if you have a dishwasher which is a very efficient one, but you always go heavy duty, no matter you have one plate or one glass in this dishwasher, you will waste energy, even if you have something which is very efficient. This is why it's so important that we take on board uh, into the operations of the system, into air traffic management, the fact that those aircraft, those future machines, engines, and so on, will have specificities in the terms they, they have to, f the way they have to fly to be fuel efficient, to, fa to be environmentally efficient. If you take the example of engines, they are optimized for a, a certain altitude, for instance. So we need to make sure that those aircrafts are actually flying at this altitude if we want to optimize how they are actually performing.
Yeah. So, Sorry, just building on that, I think it's a very important point that we are connecting the two uh, joint undertakings, the two uh, work streams uh, and the two technology roadmaps very closely because, as you rightly said, we are going to see aircraft which have a better performance, a significantly better performance, uh, but at a reduced speed, uh, at a reduced altitude potentially. Uh, and that will then fit, doesn't fit anymore into the standard air traffic management environment. And there we need to build a bridge between the product and the operations. And I think that's a, that's a key point as well for our common work over the next years, uh, where we connect the two JUs very intensively. Wow, I know that we're in the air lab and it's, you know, geek heaven, but I, that's really amazing. I find that really quite fascinating. But why can't we do that now? I mean, why can't the ATM system already optimise? So the system already optimized it to a certain extent. Um, if I take the example of, uh, of the uh, uh, new fleets of A320 or, or 737, which are operating in our skies, if I look back 20, about 10 years ago, uh, when I was still uh, in, in operations, the most demanded flight level was uh, uh, the 330, um, so uh, uh, 330 feet. Uh, and, and now uh, it is. 390, simply because those engines, those new aircrafts are optimized to fly higher. So this is when most of the traffic is going right now. So we, we are coping with that. The problem is that when we are having more complex trajectory, potentially, with more demanding flight levels, altitudes, whatever, and you add on top of that more traffic, you have more complexity in the airspace. And this is where the problem is kicking in, because we do not have today what we call a scalable system. We don't have a system that can adapt quickly, either in terms of number of aircrafts or in terms of complexity of their trajectories. Why? Because it's, it's largely a manual system. There's a lot of manual intervention into the system. So we see that today in our ability to scale it up to the growth that we see in our skies. Last year, we had about 3% of traffic increase in Europe. We still have about 3% this year. So despite uh, the efforts that we are bringing in, uh, in moving Cesar into the operation, this is not fast enough to cope with this growing complexity and this growing demand. So do you think we're at peak indifference now on this whole issue? Do you think exactly those facts, our growth continues, the pressure from school children out on, out on streets protesting, do you think all this stuff is actually going to impact what you do or, or change your priorities? Um, the answer is yes. I think uh, we, we are entering in a different uh, world of aviation. Um, the challenges, the objectives are different. I don't think it, it, it is uh, uh, an answer to fly less, less. My answer is more to fly better. We, we need to be smarter in the way we fly air aircraft. We need to eliminate the waste uh, that we have in the system today. And we need, of course, to introduce new engines, new uh, type of aircrafts, which will bring benefits in the future. Well, indeed. I mean, one of the truths, of course, is that we're on a, already on about the seventh generation of airframe, but still only now entering the third generation of ATM systems, mm -hmm. which is, is an enormous problem. But let's talk about the eighth generation of airframes for a moment. What is, is the future in, in decarbonisation? I mean, we, if you look at these amazing Concords here, that's recognisably an aeroplane. I mean, every aeroplane looks about the same. It's a tube with wings on the side. Are there many more potential savings in the design of airframes, do you think, Axel? They are, specifically when you look at long-range aircraft, uh, where aerodynamics is going to play a, a, a key role, is playing a key role, and is going to play an even uh, 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 more important role in the future. Uh, when you think about, let's say, blended wing designs, for example, uh, just speaking about one, one single element, uh, aircraft will then look totally different than, than nowadays and in the past. Uh, but I, I believe the, the higher potential lies in the, in the propulsion system. Uh, in, the, in the engines. In, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. In Sorry, the I'm, I'm, I'm just a dumb Aussie. You know, no, that, that, yeah, yeah, that, that, that I, I use for you engines, yeah, you, if yeah. it's easy for you. Yeah. Well, I think it's easy for everyone, frankly. Yeah. But, and it's shorter, fewer keystrokes. And when, when you, I, I spoke briefly about aerodynamics, I, I think there is a, is a, there are different elements. There is the, the aerodynamics environment, there is the lightweight structures environment, um, there is the, uh, the configuration, uh, and there is a propulsion, respectively, engine environment, uh, which is going to be key to attack uh, the uh, climate uh, change problem. But in terms of uh, propulsion, in terms of energy, uh, in terms of engines, uh, I think there is the highest potential. And, when you look at the, what you, what you also said, when you look at the options which we have with electrification, um, that is going to hit all, all topics in terms of uh, CO2, in terms of fuel burn, in terms of CO2, in terms of uh, NOx, and in terms of noise. Uh, for me, the big question is how 
quickly can we implement those type of technologies into an, into an aircraft environment? Uh, how, how quickly can we integrate those kind of technologies into the aircraft environment? If you ask me about uh, UAVs, if you ask me uh, about unmanned air vehicles or, or smaller air vehicles, very quickly, uh, but that's not the problem of today. The problem in terms of CO2 uh, is in the commercial aircraft environment. Uh, and there, the uh, existing technologies, meaning uh, battery technology or fuel cell technologies, are not at a stage yet which make them usable. At the, at the moment, the payload, which current aircraft can take uh, would be not sufficient to take the, 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 the weight of the batteries on board in order to fly them. So there is a, is a huge step to be done, but we can do something intermediate, and I think that is what we call hybrid electrical propulsion, uh, where we can have existing gas turbines producing electrical energy and then feeding the electrical motors, which we put onto the aircraft in, in providing the, the propulsion uh, 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 and, and, and thrust which is necessary uh, to move the aircraft. And, and how far away is that? Because that sounds like quite a, quite a good step. It is quite a good step. Um, for me, it will start with, I, I call that regional aircraft, uh, which is not the 200, 300, 400 seater uh, aircraft environment, which is the 100 and below 100 aircraft environment. And I believe there we are going to see in the time frame, uh, from a technology point of view, uh, we are going to work on that immediately now and in the coming few years. But in terms of products and entry into service of products, uh, that will be probably, let's say, mid-30s. We can, we can expect those products to be in the market, which is, in terms of impact on 2050, significant, because then you have 15 years of putting products into the market in order to take old products out of the market and, and allow that sustainability question to be, to be taken. Will, will those aircraft travel at the same speed, grosso modo, as, as current aeroplanes? Because this is a question for Florian at some levels. If the aeroplanes are going more slowly, that's going to impact your system as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So will these aircraft axles, sorry, travel at the same speed, do you think, these hybrid I, I think that, that's roughly going to be the same speed. There's going okay. to be not such a big difference with this type of technology, uh, and this would be, the impact would be rather limited. Um, but we have uh, some topics uh, which are non-CO2, uh, which are, for example, uh, uh, contrails, uh, uh, yep. uh, clouds, etc., and that is something where air traffic management can play a significant role, because there we need to fly at various uh, altitudes uh, during the cruise, uh, not staying at the same altitude uh, and this is something where, yep. where ATM will be quite significantly impacted. I, I think this is really where a, a big change will happen. Uh, in air traffic control, we used to tell the aircraft where to go, what to do, basically. Uh, it's going to be the other way around. I mean, the work of air traffic management will be to make sure that we can accommodate the trajectory of the aircraft because this trajectory will be the most efficient one. So if it has to fly at a certain altitude, if it has to fly according to certain win winds, for instance, uh, or weather conditions, uh, the work of the entire system should be geared towards making sure this can happen. Okay, I mean, that's, that's obviously inspirational. And, and, but is there anything we can do to speed up introduction of some of this stuff? I mean, we, we seem to have a remarkably... Uh, laborious is not the right word, but a remarkably detailed and slow and deliberative process for bringing new technologies into the market, both in the ATM area and, and obviously in the, uh, in, in the product area. Is there something we can do to make that happen a little more quickly? Um, I, I think there are plenty of things that we, we can surely do that, by the way, we are already doing in terms of, of moving the system forward. I think incentives on how the different uh, uh, stakeholders, whether they are the airlines, the manufacturers, the air traffic management systems, are to be looked at carefully. Uh, today, we have incentives which are gearing the system to be, um, well, safe, of course. This we don't want to jeopardize about. Uh, but as well uh, to be um, uh, efficient in terms of expediting the, the traffic. Uh, maybe we need to uh, put the environment up front, uh, right behind safety. Uh, if you look even at the IKO definition of air traffic management, it's uh, safety first, then comes the uh, efficiency of uh, accommodating the traffic, so basically without delays and so on. And environment is not even mentioned in the definition of air traffic management. So we need to bring that up front. Um, we need to make sure that the system is incentivized in terms of the uh, uh, economic performance regulation to make sure that it delivers uh, uh, benefits in terms of uh, environmental behavior. I think if we look at the pure technology uptake as well, we have a, a real difficulty in our domain. Um, we have long cycles for uh, aircraft. Okay, everybody can understand that it takes a lot of time to uh, upgrade a, a, an engine. Um, 
there are some questions whether this can be uh, shortened, and I, I will leave it to uh, Axel uh, to, to come on that. Uh, in, uh, in the air traffic management domain, it's more, much more about information management, IT. We still have very long cycles. One of the reasons is that we are very prescriptive in terms of uh, regulation, for instance. Uh, we prescribe technology instead of prescribing performance. So we need to shift as well the regulatory framework into a, a performance environment. This is coming from uh, engineers' behavior. I mean, I'm an engineer myself, so we tell the regulator, this is what we have, and you have to put that into the regulation. It has to work the other way around. The regulator has to be prescriptive on what is the expected benefit of the system at the end of the day, how the system should behave, and let the technology kick in to fulfill those requirements. Uh, that's absolutely inspiring, what you're saying, but how easily do you think the regulators will change? I think we, we, we are having a lot of discussions with uh, regulators right now. ICAO is, is fully uh, uh, into this uh, mindset. Uh, we start to see a good development in this direction. But of course, you don't change a, a complete system overnight. Uh, we have as well this type of uh, approach with EASA. We, we, we have uh, uh, discussion in relation to uh, um, regulation on data communication and how we can move it into the performance-based environment. I think what helps us a lot as well is uh, the developments of uh, new entrants, like uh, uh, the drone players, uh, who are coming with a large variety of different types of operation and technology, and for which it's, it's irrelevant from day one to start to, uh, to shape regulation according to technology. Uh, so it's, it's as well a way to, uh, I would say, sandbox new way of, of dealing with regulatory matters. Sandbox as a verb. I'm, going, I'm not going to touch that. Um, the, but the drone example is actually a, a good example, at, but not a great example, or, or not a good example of what you're trying to say. Because yes, when EASA was writing the drone rules, it was all performance based. But the moment it got to the parliament, all of a sudden, some incredibly prescriptive bits were put in. It's obviously hard to make regulators be brave enough to go to a performance base rather than a prescriptive base in an industry which has always been extraordinarily prescriptive. Yeah, but there are big challenges ahead to go in this direction. If you look at developments that uh, uh, we foresee in relation to uh, artificial intelligence, okay, uh, we have certification which is based today uh, on predictive uh, system. How can it cope with uh, a new type of system like uh, uh, based on, on the big data or artificial intelligence? So we know this, this is kicking in and we know we have to adapt the environment to it. Again, it's not going to happen overnight, but there, are, there is some good work uh, that is ongoing in this direction already. Well, let's talk about big data for a moment because I think, you know, clearly an, aer an aeroplane increasingly is a flying data generating yes. machine, isn't it? It is actually, uh, and when you look at the number of sensors uh, the aircraft manufacturers are putting uh, into their aircraft and into the various systems, it's amazing. Uh, it's, it goes exponential. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was mainly the engines, uh, and lots of data was in this still coming from the engine, and it's, it's uh, looked at, it's evaluated, uh, and, and from there, they are checking when uh, they can have uh, maintenance schedules, for example. Uh, now lots of senders are starting to become injected into structures um, where the structure maintenance is, is uh, uh, not anymore done after certain cycles uh, but depending on the need uh, and these senders are telling the maintenance people exactly when there is an inspection necessary when there is a part to be changed uh, and this means that there is over time no unpredicted maintenance anymore and yeah. this is going to be a big big cost factor for the airlines I, and I presume not only no unpredictable maintenance requirements and so forth, but one assumes then to come back to the ATM element, hopefully the ATM can be predictive and be using this data in, in much more intelligent ways, if you like. I mean, we're great at generating data in aviation, but we're not dreadfully good at using it. Do, do you see that changing, Florian? Do, do you think we're going to... How does big data impact ATM? Um, I, well, to answer your question, yes, I see it changing, and I don't think we'll have a choice because this will be the mainstream of IT uh, in the future. And uh, uh, I've got myself through this kind of transition. I remember at the end of the uh, 90s, everybody was trying to keep alive their old uh, mainframes, uh, you know, the uh, IBM ones and so on. So we were buying uh, spare uh, spaces uh, uh, everywhere to a point where this, was, this machine was not on the market anymore. Mm. So at some point, you have to go with the mainstream uh, of, of technology, and this is what will happen in ATM as in anywhere, as in any other domain. Um, in big data, in relation to big data, I, I see it really as an opportunity 
including for safety benefits. Uh, I think we have a, a misconception on how we can use the data in at least ATM, if not in aviation globally, in the sense that we, we have tried so far to get the most accurate data, the most precise data, the most reliable data. Um, what we see today developing uh, more and more through the big data activities is that you can reach actually a higher level of performance with the combination and hybridation of a lot of data because you have the computing power to, to treat that and, and to get the accuracy out of a multiple source of information. And that's going to a certain extent to the opposite direction than the one we've, we've pursued so far. But at the end of the day, if we can prove that this is safer, bringing additional benefits, and again, I think the, the drone industry is, uh, is uh, showing the path to a certain extent on that, including on things like navigation, for instance. This is really valuable because ultimately this is what we need to, to have a, a decarbonized aviation as well, to have some uh, uh, performance that we can extract from the system from different sources. And what's the connection then between the airframe and the ATM? All this big data that the aeroplane's making and, and all the data that you're trying to process in the ATM, do you think, is it, is it real time? Are we going to start to have massive tubes of data flowing down into the ANSPs? Or is all this done sort of preemptively? No, I, I think we need to have this, this in, instantly. Uh, and, and that's what, what Florian said before. I think what we need is the, the ATM allowing the aircraft to go where, where it, it's, 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 it's best to go in terms of uh, fuel burn, in terms of environmental impact, in terms of optimizing the time. Uh, between point A and point B, and I think this optimization can be des best done uh, at, at product level because each of the products are, are different. The ATM system, if, if the ATM system would be able to accommodate these individual requirements, uh, that would be brilliant, um, and th this is exactly the way to go. The question is how long will it take and how much would need to yep. be invested because it's also a question of, of, of money in the end, uh, how much need to be invested in order to overhaul uh, the ATM systems in line with that requirement. We're going to talk about money, don't you worry. Yeah. Um, you, again, Florian, you mentioned the drone industry. What we're watching with the drones is, at some levels, what's already happened in the aeroplane. We're watching the intelligence move to the edge of the network. Once upon a time, all the intelligence for the telephone network was in the operator and who'd have to pull the plugs and connect them. Now we've got enough technology in our pocket to put a man on the moon. Um, we're watching that with aeroplanes as well. I mean, aeroplanes don't need three miles of separation. They could separate to within, you know, within, to within a centimetre of their, their wingtips, frankly. But yet we continue to run with this very human intervention, very, uh, very yep. absolutely handmade. Every aircraft flight is, is, is lovingly handcrafted as if it's an artisanal cheese or something. Uh, um, the, but in, in, the, in the UTM area, we're watching automated deconfliction, things like that. Is that where you think it's going to go for ATM as well, using all this intelligence but that the aeroplane has? Let's take a simple but real example uh, in relation to data and how it can help to, uh, to improve the system. So one of the things that has been developed in the context of CESAR is what we call the 4D trajectory. So the uh, ability to uh, um, get the uh, trajectory of the aircraft in three dimension and time. Um, ATM used to work on radar information. Basic radar information is to detect where the aircraft is. And then the air traffic management system was trying to figure out where this aircraft will go. Uh, mm -hmm. So deducting from the past trajectory, deducting from the way it was flying so far, where it's likely to go, uh, but with some algorithms that have been developed along the way that are nowhere near uh, artificial intelligence or anything like that, uh, but trying to understand uh, what will be the next step so that basically the controller could anticipate if there is a, a loss of separation or a risk of loss separation between two aircraft. One of the things that we, we've developed in CESAR is to say, okay, let's stop doing that. Let's get the trajectory from the aircraft directly because the flight management system that you have in any modern aircraft knows where the bloody hell the aircraft will go and at what time it will reach and at what time it will land exactly with a very high degree of accuracy and precision. Uh, so this is now data that has been standardized, that, is, uh, uh, that can be downlinked uh, from the aircraft to the um, uh, air traffic control system and that basically can feed directly the tools of the controller to say this is where the aircraft will be, not only where it is right now, not only where it will be in one minute, but where it will be all the way through its trajectory up to the landing point. And that makes a big difference. 
And that's back again to the connectivity, which is essential, because for sure you need to have a, a strong and robust link uh, with the aircraft to get this information. Deconfliction by intent, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Do we get to a point eventually, though, where the aircraft self-separate, or do we always need some umpire in the middle? That was a question. Is that was a question? <laughs> um, so, well, uh, sorry, Axel, do you think we're going to get to a place where the aircraft self-separate, or do you always see a role for ATM? No, I, I think the separation can be minimised, uh, and as you said, the wingtip to wingtip at the end. If you have an automated system, a reliable automated system, uh, no manual intervention anymore, uh, there is enough space up there to optimise. It's not a question of space up there, it's a question of uh, using the space in the most appropriate way, and that's what we do not do nowadays, yep. because we, we don't have the means right now. So the difficulty is not on the aircraft side. Again, it's back to the fact that if you have, let's say, two modern aircraft that are just delivered uh, uh, out of the uh, assembly line, which have this capability, uh, and honestly, it's been demonstrated that it's feasible for two aircraft to self-separate or to keep a separation rather than self-separate. So basically, to maintain a separation uh, so that the controller could delegate this separation to those two aircraft. The problem is not those two aircraft, it's all the other aircraft which do not have the same capability and how long it takes for the entire fleet to get this capability so that you can actually fully integrate it into the system. So this is this complexity that air traffic management has to manage, integrating new capabilities that can support the work of the pilot and the controllers, but at the same time dealing with the rest of the variety of the traffic. The, the cynic in me says the solution to that, of course, is to simply have much harder, tighter requirements to retire old aircraft, which, of course, you can justify on environmental grounds anyway, because old aircraft have a tendency to produce more emissions than new aircraft, just as a matter of truth. So, but let, let's go back to carbon for, I mean, I could talk about, as you yep. know, I could talk about this all day, but <laughs> let's, let's go back to carbon for a minute. To what extent, then, Axel, is the decarbonisation going to be driven by fuel? Do you see, bio, are biofuels the answer? I believe in the end we are going to have a bouquet of, of different topics in order to face this unique challenge of decarbonisation. I think technology at aircraft level, uh, spoken about that briefly, uh, this is definitely a big topic. Uh, we have ATM and the optimization of the operation, the second one, and for me the third element is definitely sustainable aviation fuels. Um, uh, and there, there are various ways. Uh, you can go via the, uh, the biomass, uh, you can go via power to liquid uh, using energy, solar energy and electrolyze in order to, uh, to uh, uh, have uh, new energy carriers uh, which can be drop in as well. Uh, I believe that's a very important element uh, that we have uh, uh, to use the existing infrastructure because I think it will very hardly work if we try to build up a second infrastructure alongside the existing one uh, because the infrastructure investment will be huge. Um, and I think this combination uh, of uh, technology at aircraft level, operations and drop-in sustainable aviation fuels, that's going to be the mix for the zero carbon in 2050. So the, I mean, we're really good at building new infrastructure in aviation. I don't know why you're being so cynical. I mean, you just, just it should take no time at all. We're really good at new infrastructure. I, I'm not quite sure about that. <laughs> specifically in, when you in Australia, you mean? <laughs> well, specifically, when you think about the investment, look, we're, we are thinking now about the next Clean Sky program, uh, looking at the optimization of the product itself, uh, and we, we haven't really fixed the, the cost related to that. But it, it could be up to 10 billion. Let's assume there, are, there, are, there is, a, is a bill to of 10 billion of research work to be performed in order to get to that level. Then you have to perform the aircraft development on top afterwards, which takes another five years. And let's assume we have two or three manufacturers in the world, each investing another 10 to 15 billion on that one. And then you have the airlines to buy all of those new products in order to retire the old stuff uh, and put the new products into the market. And I can't even quote that number, uh, taking 20, 30,000 aircraft out of operations. Um, this takes time. And, and I think that, that's a huge investment. And I think we need to give ourselves, and, and I mean we as, 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 as the public opinion as well, need to give ourselves the time in order to do that. Uh, because radical solutions uh, to uh, demand a change from one day to the other, they do not work. 
I like to make a remark regarding the, the infrastructure, which I think is uh, is quite um, uh, important uh, in terms of looking at at the big picture as well, uh, because very often. Aviation is compared to other transport mode, uh, but we always compare the operations. Uh, if you compare aviation at ra with rail, for instance, the cost of the rail infrastructure is huge in terms of building this infrastructure. I'm talking about the cost of, uh, in terms of carbon emission, in terms of uh, environmental cost. Uh, it takes between 20 and 30 years before you can get a return on investment in terms of operating this infrastructure in a carbon neutral way. So this is as well the type of comparison that has to kick in to look at how we manage the, the uh, uh, environment globally in aviation, in all transport mode. If I look at the aviation and the, the runway, for instance, aspects, which has a huge environmental footprint, I think what is at stake today is as well how do we get the most out of existing runways? How do we optimize them before we start to look at, at building new terminals and runway? I think this is really a fundamental question uh, that we have, uh, unfortunately, maybe for some in Europe to, to look at because we have constraints today in terms of building new runway and infrastructure. But I think it is as well an opportunity to get the most of what we have, which is as well an environmental uh, uh, efficiency way of looking at things. It's a bit of a rubrics cube, isn't it? You know, th there's so many bits you've got to get right to get it to work together. I mean, alternatively, we could look at what you've just said, Florian, and say, well, let's get basically what you've just said is let's get more aeroplanes into the air. That, that has an emission cost that's going to go back to that original dichotomy between traffic growth and the requirement to decarbonise. Um, so that then brings us back again to the subject, the subject of fuel and what can we do to, yeah, to, to if, fix that. If, if there are emission free aircraft, then, then the question is not then a problem. Then, 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 then the problem wind. is solved. Yeah, then it's yeah. just a question, can we bring these aircraft into the air and operate them safely? safely? Well, absolutely, which then actually we are now going to start talking money, which you, your program is, is not cheap. Your program is not cheap either. Yet aviation is remarkably poorly low has a very low tax to be frank I, I know they will tell you they have an extremely high tax base but it's just not true and as there's an initiative tomorrow as i mentioned before to try to look at taxing fuel is that something you'd encourage as a means of funding all this stuff from my point of view the question is where do we where do we invest the money uh, do we invest the money which is available with the airlines or with whoever uh, and put it into uh, focused research or focused development in order to, to tackle the, the question, or do we uh, uh, put it into uh, state budgets uh, where they disappear in, 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 into something which is not focused? Uh, and I think there is a limited amount of money available, and the question is really, how do we use this limited amount of money in the best and most optimal way? But at the moment, I, I can't disagree with you, I completely agree with you, but at the moment, that's, you're being funded by money that's gone into mm -hmm. state coffers, and being distributed in all sorts of places, including for you gentlemen. So why, I mean, even if that's all that happens, surely that's better, isn't it? The more money we have to spend on stuff like this, the better it would be. It's not just a question of money, and I think that, that that's another element I'd like to bring into the, uh, into the game, because it's also a question of people, uh, of, of competent people, experts, scientists, in order to perform the work. And I think there we are quite limited in Europe, when you look at the the competences are very high and, and uh, very well educated people, uh, but the numbers are limited. So that's why we also can't just pour another couple of billions into it and by that one automatically assume we can double the speed. Uh, th this, this doesn't work. We need to organize ourselves in the most efficient way uh, and by that one making use of the available money, uh, but we need to take the resources into account at the same time. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that taxation is the price you pay for civilization. And Education is clearly an example of where, where the money is well spent, I'd have thought, yes. as opposed to sustaining all sorts of... Yeah, you know, no, but I, I think there is a, a, a true and valid question that we do see when we discuss with politicians, whether taxpayers' money should fund programs like Clean Sky or Cesar, and you could have the same question for a lot of domains in terms of research and development. Um, I, I think what is fundamental uh, is that this should be a, 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 a true political choice. Uh, and um, uh, you could ask why the uh, uh, airlines are not paying for the research we're doing. And actually, they are paying already for a lot of things, for operating the system, for uh, operating the airports and so on. I so why aren't the airlines paying for the research that you're doing? I mean, your research, both of you, is, is extremely pointed. It's extremely focused, isn't it? I mean... Yes. If I pay a tax on a train ticket, I'm not going to be getting the, 
that, that, that isn't of no, ben no benefit to what you're doing or, or irrelevant to what you're doing. No, but so, it's, it's, it's not going to pay for the research that is going on train and, and terrestrial well, transportation well, either. Well, well, I live in hope that some of it might. But it's, so it's, should, we, should we have a special fund? No, but then you start to have a, a completely different discussion on how you connect the taxation to the objective of the taxation, which is a, a, a broader hypothec discussion. Hypothecated no. taxes, it's called. I think, I and think do, you know who, do you know who stopped that in Europe? Mrs. Thatcher, she got rid of hypothecated taxing. So okay. it's a yet another legacy. <laughs> so I think what, what, what matters is, is there, there is an acknowledgement that our domain, aviation at large, what we see here, is of, of strategic importance for, for Europe. Uh, it's strategic for its competitiveness. Uh, it's strategic for, as well, our sovereignty uh, in terms of, of being able to develop a number of technologies which are uh, uh, being owned and, and uh, uh, developed uh, in, in, uh, on the European continent. Uh, I think what is important as well is what is the societal objective at the end of the day that we're trying to pursue. Um, connectivity is something important. Um, it was uh, recalled yesterday that since the opening of the uh, airline market of Europe, uh, the, the connectivity index ha has grown and able basically all the families, all the businessmen in Europe to get an easy access to the different countries and actually has built the European continent largely uh, thanks to aviation. So this is an asset uh, and I think this is a question for politicians. How do we preserve this asset? How do we move it forward as well? And how do we keep it for the future knowing that there are other challenges as well to address? But, but bringing it back again though to the environment point, I mean, it's clear that currently the aviation industry doesn't pay for the externalities. Uh, it doesn't pay for the pollution that it's causing, things like that. So, uh, but who is paying at the end? When you when you, when you try to compare really apples with apples, uh, who is who is paying for that? In the end, it's it's the, the all of us, the taxpayer. Whether it's trains, whether it's cars, or whether it's th th that's for all of them. I, I the completely same. agree. But but uh, most economists, I think, would argue that you should pay for the externalities that you cause. And the more we do that, the less we have to just simply rely on the poor bloody taxpayer, right, the PBT, um, to have to fund all of these things. So, so, I mean, the work you do is demonstrably valuable, but it has to be paid for, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. And, and like in, in, in Florian's case as well, uh, we, we have here a balance pay because the, the half of our money is coming from the European Commission and the other half is coming from the private side. So the private side is contributing and this is basically the the, uh, the, the, the private industry is contributing uh, in a 50-50 uh, uh, private-public partnership, as it's called, uh, in, that, in that venture. And I think that uh, seems to be quite a fair share in, in, in sharing the risk because we are doing very, very high risk uh, work and, and even now trying to accelerate it and then trying to focus uh, on carbon emission flying uh, in that time frame uh, 2050. And again, it's not about 2050. It's about starting to do the work now in order to be really carbon free at that time that all the products are going to be replaced. That requires uh, a, a balanced approach and I think there the taxpayer's money is well invested from my point of view, right. from a taxpayer's point of view. As a taxpayer. Uh, because I, I, I do also pay tax. <laughs> always pleased to hear. Um, Florian, what's the, what's the CESAR joint undertakings? Is it 50-50 now? That's, a, that's the same uh, type of approach as, as Clean Sky, so we have uh, the pretty much the same type of leverage effect, uh, and uh, basically it's set up as well as a public-private partnership. Uh, the main difference is that we have a, a direct contribution as well of an international organization, which is called Eurocontrol, which is uh, uh, responsible in particular to manage the Air Traffic Management Europe um, uh, network. Uh, and uh, yes, it's, it's a kind of risk-taking as well approach. Uh, mm -hmm. it, I mean, these are long-term issues. So for uh, um, industries which are, of course, driven by market, including by uh, uh, short-term aspects of the market, it's as well a high risk to invest in such technologies, in such uh, demonstration, validation activities. And this is where the, the public uh, uh, support is important so that the, the risk can be properly shared between society to a certain extent that needs aviation, coming back to the previous discussion, and the industry which is providing the product, the services which are making things fly. To what extent, to what extent do the airlines appreciate the work that you're doing over at Caesar? They always ask for more, uh, and I think they are entitled to. Um, they want it to go uh, faster. They, they do acknowledge that it's vital. If I look at what happened last summer and which is picking up in the, in the airspace right now, which is a congestion of the airspace, this has a huge impact on their operations. This has a huge impact 
on the passengers at the end of the day, on the, on the connectivity, on the passenger experience that you can get. And this has a huge impact on their business. So of course they want uh, to have a system that delivers a, a high level of quality and uh, uh, they are concerned about the fact that this is too slow right now. Uh, the upgrade of the system is not coping with the traffic it squeeze, it's not coping with the need to to, to protect the, the trajectories of the aircraft. I think this is, for me, the worrying thing that I see right now. I mean, if we look at the Euro control uh, figures, the traffic increased last year in Europe of 3% and the CO2 emission of 5%. This is not the right trajectory. We need to do something about that because we are, we are hitting uh, not just the uh, passenger experience, but as well the environment because of this congestion. So certainly they are interested, but it's not going fast enough. Uh, uh, but are the airlines part of the people contributing on the, in the PPP, that is the CESAR joint undertaking, is, is there any airline money going into the work that CESAR does? So, uh, first of all, they have, uh, um, uh, by regulation, uh, voting rights at the board of the SJU, which is uh, kind of unique in all the different partnerships, because they are somehow representing the end users. Uh, the regulator, uh, the European Union, decided to give them a share in the voting rights. So they are represented in the governance, so they have a say on the priorities, they have a say on the... Uh, uh, strategies that we are taking. My question wasn't the uh, saying the governance, my question no, was the, do they open their wallet? They do open their wallet because they do participate to d what we call demonstration activities. So what, when we are maturing progressively technology, we try to bring it as close as possible to the market conditions. And there basically we are asking contribution from the airlines to participate to those activities, which can require upgrading their system, which can require actually running specific trajectories. We had the uh, uh, um, I think it's around 30,000 flights uh, of uh, commercial uh, aircraft contributing to Cesar. This were run by the airlines. Right. And, and Axel, thank you. And Axel, are the airlines a direct partner uh, with, with your in Clean Sky? Or? No, they're not. Uh, they are not. They are uh, consulted in certain projects uh, which are closer to operational topics. Uh, they are consulted, they are coming in, but they are not part of the, neither the funding nor the governance uh, of, uh, of Clean Sky. Um, while we also have to see, usually the airlines uh, have a view in terms of uh, operating problems within the coming few years and uh, when we are speaking about technology development, we are speaking about technology development which is at least stopping five years before an entry into service of that type of technology in an airline. So that's why in terms of their visibility, uh, they, are, they are rather focused on the shorter term uh, topics uh, and not on the, on the longer term. And, and, and typically in research, uh, we, are, we are at least five years away from, uh, from an operational implementation. But maybe as well, what is important to stress is that the air traffic management system is paid by the airline. I mean, we, are in Euro we have in Europe a different situation compared to the US, where the, the US system is paid by the US taxpayer, basically. In Europe, this is paid by the airlines through the tickets, of course. Uh, yeah, the passengers, passengers produce the end, some of that money. Yeah. yeah, but okay, that's a fair choice. You decide to take the, uh, uh, the plane, ultimately you pay for the system that is running the, the, the operations. So the airlines are already paying for a, a big part of the system, if you look at it. But, but they're paying for today's system. They're not, yeah, paying, they're not sure. paying for the new system. But there, to a certain extent, they do pay as well for the new system because they are paying the aircraft manufacturers and the engine manufacturers, etc., for the products. Uh, and within the product, there is a certain percentage for research and technology development. So basically, in the end, uh, you and me and, and us flying, uh, we are paying the airlines, and the airlines are paying the manufacturers, and the manufacturers are paying for the research. So at the end... Uh, it's an airline, to a certain extent, uh, being contributing significantly to the research, indirectly, not, not directly in terms of we pay for the research, but we pay for the products, for the latest products, and, and they embed the research. To what extent, thank you, to what extent, though, then, <clears throat> does that mean we're not letting some of the market forces drive some of this stuff? I mean, if, if all you're doing is working at a research level and you're getting to a place where five years from here we may have a new airframe that'll come out that's better, surely airlines would like the competitive advantage of that airframe faster. Uh, but I'm not, and I'm not seeing airlines trying to get involved. Florian knows what's coming. Um, and I'm going to ask the same question about ATM in just a moment. But do you see the airlines getting impatient for these changes and wanting more and then starting to bring in a competitive element? Can we use competition to speed up research? Definitely, competition is always good. And I believe there is hard competition when you look out there uh, in terms of when you look at the ecosystems. I, I, 
basically we are operating in the European ecosystem uh, with a few others contributing. There is the, uh, the US ecosystem, which is a very strong one, uh, very heavily supported by, by state aids. Uh, NASA alone, uh, which is, uh, seems to be for everybody its space, uh, but NASA alone uh, has a $700 million uh, commercial aviation research program per year commercial aviation, so not space. Uh, and then not to speak about the, the Chinese environment, uh, the Chinese ecosystem, uh, there is a clear target to become uh, a major player within 2025, which is for aviation uh, just in it's front tomorrow. of the door. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think there is a strong competitive element in there, and the airlines are using that as well. They are going to um, each of the people offering uh, uh, competing products, and they're trying to get the best value for money. And, and so you, you see the competition effectively between the ecosystems. Is this going to be an American design or a European design or a Chinese design or whatever? That's where you think much of that competition comes in. That's definitely because usually the products uh, are, uh, in terms of OEM, original equipment manufacturer, are uh, then either Airbus, Boeing uh, or the Chinese Comac, if I, if I just mentioned the three now. Um, in terms of uh, systems and structures, it's slightly different. Uh, their European uh, contributors uh, are there and, 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 and suppliers are there to heavily contribute to US products or, or also Chinese products, uh, and vice versa. US companies as well, less Chinese companies for the moment, but uh, uh, US companies are heavily contributing to European OEMs and to European products. Indeed, time will tell, I'm sure, on the Chinese side. So, Florian, is there a, an ecosystem level competition between the European ATM environment and the US research that's being done under NextGen and, and Carrot in Japan and so forth? Is, do you feel that pressure? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I think more and more um, this, will, this will be an important element uh, of aviation in the sense that. Uh, Okay, we are all passionate about aircraft and all those uh, fantastic things and, and what we see uh, during the air show. But what we have ahead of us is really the ecosystem. It's a value chain. How do you get the value out of the system at the end of the day? And ultimately, the, the operating uh, of the system is extremely important. Uh, and if you have a, an operating environment that enables you to have better trajectory, more capacity in the airspace, and so on, that's an added value to your aviation system. And we do see that uh, popping around the world. Uh, all the big nations or emerging nations, they invest in aviation. That's very clear. We see that in the Middle East, in Asia. This is where we have the biggest growing uh, uh, numbers. Um, and what we see is that what comes next is the congestion of the airspace. Uh, and immediately, these problems uh, has an impact on the rest of the aviation chain, because you see that in China, they've built a big number of uh, uh, airports, massive. Uh, but now, the airspace system is totally stuck. So uh, this is really uh, an important element. And I think this is where I'm, I'm quite proud when I see that the, the solutions that we are developing in Cesar are being taken by a number of countries, sometimes faster than actually in Europe. But when we look at the Middle East, when we look at Asia, they are really considering implementing such solutions because they are as well coming with a kind of modular approach, which means it's not a monolithic system and you take it, it's all of it or nothing. It's, it's something that allows you to make progress and to progressively uh, optimize your airspace and, and grow in terms of capacity and, uh, and better uh, trajectories. But do you, do you only see it in terms of a system? I mean, all those benefits that you talked about, um, being able to use the airspace better to, to be more efficient in terms of your operations, to fly faster or straighter or with less emissions and so on, they are benefits that individual airlines also like aren't they? I mean, surely, well, I know they are. If I'm an airline, that's what I want. So my question, one of the things that mystifies me about European aviation, indeed aviation globally, is why airlines don't look to ATM to get competitive advantage at an airline versus airline level. Why can't they start to use competitive ATM as a means to start to be better than their, co their competition? Uh, because they well, first of all, they don't control the system, so they are, they are uh, uh, not in control of that system, so they can certainly, uh, uh, and, and we've seen that in Europe in terms of how, for instance, airlines are, are routing their traffic according to the charges they are paying. That's a way to play the system in a, in a kind of competitive manner. 
um, but uh, they are not in control of that system. Well, they don't control the system at the moment, but let me tell you, a few years ago now, I was at a, a meeting where Michael O'Leary came, and it was a Canzo meeting, so it was ANSPs from all over the world, and he said, why can't I go out to the European market, why can't I go to the ANSP of Germany, of, of the UK, of Ireland, whatever, and say, I'm Ryanair, this is all of my flying, control me. Yep. And but if he did that, he'd get a price, for sure, I, I, he'd get I think a better that, price. I think that we might get there uh, at some point. Uh, so, so honestly, today we, we are not there from a technology standpoint, which means that you still have to have one NSP in a piece of airspace to make it simple to control it. Uh, and then you have de facto a monopolistic situation regarding how this airspace is managed. We are working on solutions whereby the aircrafts are managed according to the trajectory. So we Basically, we are working on solutions whereby you stop putting the airspace into those small slices and control them individually, but you control according to the trajectory of the aircraft. And ultimately, this could open at some point what you're describing, which is I have a fleet, I want to fly it through the European airspace or the US airspace system, and whoever is able to provide me with a solution, I will go for it. Uh, that's what we do in the military already, isn't it? I mean, the issue isn't the technology, surely. The issue is an industrial issue because we still sectorize all of the airspace. Yeah, but I mean, we, 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 uh, this I can't let you say that in the sense that the, the military comparison is interesting, but there are as well limits to it. If you will manage the uh, uh, European airspace with the military approach, you will have uh, uh, 10 times less capacity than what you have in the airspace, and it will cost probably 10 times more because uh, the, the amount of, of uh, manpower that you need to manage one aircraft is in no comparison with what we, we do in... Uh, and, in and of course, thing. if we did it in the military way, we'd also have about 10 times more noise because military aircraft are really quite very loud, aren't they? But to come back on, on one of the things that you, you both highlighted, I, I, I think the, the, the aspects related to the market are extremely important. Uh, I think this is where we will see a shift in the future uh, and we already see some airlines looking at it um, uh, from a different standpoint. I think the, the uh, sustainability of, of uh, uh, aviation will become a differentiation, a differentiation avi advantage or disadvantage for airlines. So whether you are able to provide a greener way of flying or not, at some point, this is what the passengers will be asking for. This is what the new generation will be asking for. We've always yeah, seen airlines argue that they've got a younger fleet. Suddenly, I think they're going to, you're right, they're going to start saying we have a greener fleet. But, but that's why I believe, uh, following to what you said, I, I strongly believe that we need to set ourselves ambitious targets. Uh, and I mean, carbon-free flying, carbon-free aviation by 2050 is a very ambitious target. I think what needs to come next is that we are focusing our energy and our efforts uh, into that direction. Because usually we tend to try to solve all the different topics which we have at the same time. And by diluting the effort into various streams, uh, we will not make it. So I think it's, it's very important that on top of that ambitious target, we are focusing the efforts, we are concentrating the efforts on the topic, and then also we are investing the right amount of money in order to make it, uh, and don't deviate on the, on the way. Uh, I think that, that, that's what I would take uh, as a guiding principle for us now in defining the path for Clean Skies 3. Uh, on top of all these technology questions which are coming up. Uh, but in terms of guiding North, it needs to be clear uh, what the target is and, and focus all the energy on that target. So, Florian, for you, what is that target? What is the one thing that we should be doing most of at Caesar JU? Uh, to, to me, I mean, this is really um, coming back to uh, uh, the fact that we will uh, have to tackle this environmental issue. We need to make sure that what is coming out of Clean Sky can actually fly and fly mm -hmm. properly. So uh, we, we need to stop the waste we have in the system because we are not able to uh, yes. handle proper trajectories. If I take another example of uh, airlines which are now taking individual uh, decisions to move to biofuel, to pay more than their competitors uh, to, to uh, the energy they, they bring on board, we need to make sure that trajectories are protected. I mean, what is the point of bringing on board biofuel if you burn it stupidly on trajectory which are, are not making any sense? So this is where we need to move Cesar, and for that, we need automation. We need to uh, uh, scale up the degree of automation into the system. And again, we have this connectivity with the future aircraft in terms of how the future cockpits will, will evolve. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, bring in, uh, largely speaking, this digital transformation, which is a higher degree of connectivity. 
uh, and uh, uh, we need to make it real and accelerate the pace of, of uptake as well, which is a real problem we face. We have more and more innovation in research and development. We have good initiatives in relation to upgrading the system and implementing it, but it's far too slow. That's a problem we face today. I'd like to bring one point into it, uh, uh, which is related to the certification, because what we do right now, and I think that's probably a shortfall which we need to rectify and need to focus on, is that we are today developing technologies uh, without having the certifying agency, EASA in this case, or FAA, closely connected. And I think that's a topic which we also can uh, improve uh, and focus on in Clean Sky 3, that we are connecting not just the air traffic management and the operational side to it, but also ensure that the certification experts are right from the beginning embedded in the uh, uh, technology development in order to ensure that when we are uh, at a certain type, uh, at a certain milestone, that these type of questions are taken into account and are, are answered appropriately. Right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our time, but I think, I hope you agree that we've had a really quite wide-ranging conversation from, from all sorts of aspects and, and trying to tackle what is clearly a growing and pressing need. Uh, I'd like to ask you, if you'd be so kind, just to join me in thanking both Florian and Axel for what I think was a really helpful conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much.